Hello everybody, this is Starman, and welcome back to Let's Play Betrayal of Crondor. Well, last time you remember, we were trying to make our way into the city of Sephanon, but we keep running into these shades that are trying to drain the life out of us. And uh, on two occasions, they were successful in that. But we did manage to beat a group of five of them with just Owen and Locklear by a bit of skill and a lot of luck. I think we've only got one more of these combats to go through before we can get to the city. And a quick explanation, which I don't think I bothered with last time. I briefly mentioned it in previous chapters, but uh, why is Sephanon so becursed that the people were relocated from it and the city abandoned? Well, as I mentioned before, the plot of the first trilogy of Rift War novels by Raymond E. Feist still available in paperback wherever fine books are sold, uh, detailed a war between the Dark Elves of the Northlands and the Kingdom of the Isles, and how Mermendus, I think that's how you say the name, but it's how I remember it trying to sound it out when I looked at it, uh led the Elves, Mermendus was the uh, reincarnation, supposedly, of a legendary Dark Elf leader, tried leading his people right through... High Castle, after uh, sacking the city of Armengar, leading him through the Dimwood Forest, trying to get to Sephanon for reasons which only made sense to him at the time. Suffice it to say, he thought there was an artifact of great power in Sephanon, and as a result of the war, the whole city has been abandoned, except for a secret platoon of soldiers, which... We have, uh, have been doing a remarkable job of staying hidden thus far, as close as we got to it when we were going through the Dimwood. At any rate, the fact that there are ghosts guarding the pathway into the city should let you know there is something here. Of course, unless you've been taking the dodgy way around a Crondor, it's very unlikely you'd be able to fight your way through this in Chapter 1, Chapter 2, or Chapter 3. Chapter 6, oddly enough, you can just walk right into Sephanon, no problem. But by that point, you hardly need what's hidden here. Well, how about that? I thought I had one combat left, but that was the last one. So, hey, skip the last combat. We get to go right to seeing the road before them was strange. Though Lockler wasn't sure what unnerved him about it, there was something sinister about the whole area. He wasn't too sure he wanted to follow the dusty road they were on much further. Sephanon ahead, he said. Should we continue on and take a look around? Yes! As much a fixture in the myths and legends of Midkemi as the stories of the gods told by the priests in the temples, Sephanon was nothing more now than a sad old ghost town. In passing a low brick wall which had been overgrown by ivy, they were struck by the words that had been printed there in sheep's blood. Remember us. Which is weird, because there really shouldn't have been any survivors left in the town to do that in sheep's blood. That begs the question of how they knew it was sheep's blood. I mean, did they test it? Taste it? Whatever. Lockler stared into the crevice. Standing on the rubble of Sefton's ancestral keep, he was shaken by the sight of the thousands of moored hell bones which had been used to fill the gap into the undergrounds. However interested he was in finding out what lay below, he had no desire to burrow through the moldering bodies. Okay, so, yeah... Curiosity got the best of him. Dropping to his hands and knees, Locker began pulling the rocks aside in hopes of finding something of interest. Well, spoiled rations, a shovel, a torch, some rope, and a bunch of magic scrolls. In this case, a oh. scroll of Dragon's Breath, a scroll of Danon's Delusions, and a scroll of Grief of a Thousand Nights. All fine spells, well, except for Danon's Delusions. So, yeah, we just fought our way through these impossible combats to get three magic scrolls for one spell that has its uses, but is mostly useful for avoiding combat, one spell that is not as useful as others for distracting enemy spellcasters, and what was the third one? Yeah. And Grief of a Thousand Nights, which is quite useful, but we can get it elsewhere a lot easier. 
But hey, free scrolls are free scrolls. And okay, maybe there is one more ambush here. Yeah, there is. Ah, uh, here's the two shade one, but after having fought five shades with just Owen and Locklear, this should be easy peasy. Now watch me get killed taking this very simple fight on. Shockingly, the poison arrow seems to be affecting the ghost. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I'm not going to knock it. I do love that trick when I can pull it off. Alright, so let's see how everybody's abilities have been going up. Uh, well, Locklear's strength seems to have gone up. His stealth is up at 86. Barding is at 53. Melee is now almost 80. And a go raft defense, not bad considering I wasn't focusing on it, but his stealth is darn near supernatural at this point. All right, well, let's not take chances. Let's go ahead and rest. And see what's in this house here. I know he's lived here in some time. And here's the stump. And I think we will go ahead and stop back at the shop here. Lock their way by the door. Less than a minute later, Nia hurried over from the sixth toe with a large set of keys jangling on a brass reason in her hand. I'll have that door open for you in a snap, she said as she began to search for the proper key. Ah, here it is. She inserted the key in the lock, jiggled it a few times until it clicked and pushed open the door. Yeah, Nia's goods. And yeah, the rations are much more expensive here, but we can sell our corals here. And curiously, she also sells Fatimir's formula, which you usually have to go to a more high class or more expensive shop to go to. And I finally got rid of that shovel that Locklear has been carrying around for way too long. Uh, go ahead and give... yeah. Okay, yeah, she won't take the scrolls, unfortunately. But we can sell the shells. Oh, and she'll take the dragon stone. But, uh, yeah, this shop is going to become important to us later on, because in Chapter 2, by sequence breaking the game a little bit and coming here, we've... Uh, you can see from the last time how we had that little encounter where she asked us to uh, speak well of you know Locklear to her, or speak well of her to Locklear, even though Locklear is standing right here. And it doesn't look like there's anything down this little path here except for a farm. 
And nobody's lived here in some time. Alright, so... Now with the path to Sefan uncleared, we could have gone west. into the area around, well, let me pull up the map and show you. Yeah, we could have gone west from Sefanen into the area around Tanyers and Egli, because there is never a little uh, area here. But we're going to go through Darkmoor and then to Krondor first. But we're not going to go into Krondor. That's too easy. Because we have a whole area of the game that we haven't explored yet the one you're meant to go through to get to Krondor in Chapter 1. But I did want to go to this way because we've got one more temple to get to. Heading east from Malak's Cross. And though we won't be using the teleport system too much, we uh, it's still a good idea to visit all the temples just for the fun of it and to have it ready in case you need it. So, anyway, Garth spot an ambush. Look at that tree over there. The lower limbs have been all hacked off. That remains when you're someone's property line or somebody who was ensuring they had an unobstructed view of this area. If we continue in this direction, we should proceed with great caution. Eh, you know, let's proceed with great caution after a night's rest. And hey... More Nighthawks! <coughs> Unfortunately, these guys are smarter about singling out the Spellcaster than the Shades were. Oh, <laughs> wrong spell. I meant to cast an invitation. But you know, Rusalki would help even the odds up a bit. But you know what? If I summon a Rusalki, I can't blow stuff up. And by some miracle, we got through all of them without anybody coming back from the dead. Oh, and hey, a tuning fork. Those are quite rare. And poisoned rations. Well, apparently uh, Rufia was with us when that fight broke out. Rufia being the goddess of luck. So yeah, we can pay 48, 49 sovereigns to teleport right into Malak's Cross, or 60 to go to the Temple of uh, Lim's Kragma. But really, what's the point? Now let's go talk to the priestess. 
Lock their seat. Four times I'd asked one of the temple's golden row priestesses to send for the high priestess, and four times they'd been left waiting in the alcoves of a temple's central courtyard. When at last it became apparent that their repeated summons were not going to be answered, Lockwood shook his head. We don't have time for this. Let's get going. Well, luck is a fickle mistress. Now that fight did not just take us all day. All right, so here is the village of Darkmoor, which is funny because uh, the next book in the series, well, the major series that uh, came out after Betrayal of Crondor, that Feist wrote was called the Serpent War Saga. And it started out in the village of Darkmoor, which actually was less of a village and more of a small city. And it talked about how Darkmoor was meant to be the home of the kingdom, or the western kingdom at least, uh, the best vineyards. But you wouldn't know that from this game, because there's not anything about the vineyards here. Lockler knocked on the door. After a few moments, a doe-faced woman answered, keeping one arm braced behind the door in case her visitors were less than congenial. What do you want? Although she was clearly addressing Lockler, her gaze danced nervously to the mortal. I've had enough runs with strangers of late. We were looking to get a bit of water per... Lockler started, but found the old woman had slammed the door. Not very friendly folk here. But hey, an inn. And more money. And the not heading anywhere in particular. The guy with a knife we shouldn't be talking to. And another guy with a knife. A lot of guys who killed people get knives in this town. After knocking on the small wooden door, Locklear stood back to survey the house and its surroundings. Darkmoor seems friendly enough, he said. The door swung open, his attention shifted to a smallish woman who greeted him with a hug. Oh my, aren't you a dear? My name is Caroline. What's your name? Before Lockler had a chance to answer, she ushered them all into the house. Inside, amidst a collection of knickknacks and odds and ends, no doubt collected over three quarters of a lifetime, they introduced themselves. They talked for several minutes as she refilled their water pouches with a pitcher sitting on a small wooden table in the corner. Have you seen that crazy old hen that lives down the road? She queried breathlessly. Only comes out at night. My sister Elizabeth thinks she's a witch or something. I think just thinks she's crazy. Can't really blame her. Husband and son are both killed by evil spirits, that's what they say. Their pouches full, they managed to work their way to the door. The woman was still talking as she closed the door behind them. And I just got rid of that shovel to get another one. I don't need this. Yes, shockingly enough, there is a shop here that is a bookstore. And I think we've already gotten all of these books. And yes, they have the one that gives you all the skills for 540 gold. Won't benefit us too much at this point. I don't think we've gotten the Psalms of Dala yet, though. And let's free up some space in Owen's inventory, actually. See if I can haggle it down a bit, which I can. Let's see, I think this one is the one that boosts your defense, so let's go ahead and select defense only. Essentially a book of prayers, most of the psalms dealt with the mythology surrounding the Defender Goddess and her frequent clashes with the war god Tif Onaka, Anakana, Anabanaganda, whatever. It advised which prayers should be said upon waking, which should be used before sleeping, before eating, before entering inns, and most importantly, which should be mouthed before entering battle, so the Defender Goddess would, would add her favor to the faithful's ability to defend himself. It also mentioned in passing that the Goddess would sometimes lend her favor to those that drink dollar tail milk, sometimes sold by her followers. 
I wonder if these guys will take scrolls. Yeah, they won't. But... So what did that get us? Well, defense of 72, defense of 59, and a defense of 68. Not unconsiderable. Well, I'll go ahead and speed read that one off camera. And with that, I have opened up one slot. Haha. <laughs> A lot of abandoned town, sit, uh, houses for such a lively town. A middle-aged woman met Locklear at the door. Good day to you, he began. The sentence hung unfinished in the air. Come in, aren't you, you fellows handsome? My name is Elizabeth. Are you married? My sister Caroline is a lovely young girl, and I think she's really just perfect for you. Would you like to meet her? Well, never mind that for now. Come in, come in. As the woman drug them into the house, Owen marveled at the way she seemed to be able to talk about her taking a breath. My husband would agree if he was here, but he works down at the mercantile, you know. The store just down the road does pretty well for himself. That's why we have this house, too. Yeah, this house bill's just for me. Can you imagine? I used to help him at the shop, but now he insists I stay here all day long. Isn't he just the sweetest man? After several more minutes that felt like hours, Locklear excused himself politely and headed for the door. The woman called after them as they left, but they pretended not to hear. After knocking several times, Locklear had just about concluded that nobody was home. Come on, he said in Owen's general direction. There doesn't seem to be anybody about. Just as he was preparing to leave, a shuffling sound inside the house caused attention. Hello? Is anybody there? For several more seconds, he heard nothing but silence, and again he was about to leave. This time, a hoarse whisper stopped his exit, though he couldn't make out what the voice on the other side of the door was saying. You'll have to speak a bit louder. We're just passing through, but we would like to come talk to you. Come when the sun is no longer in the sky, croaked the voice, and I will tell you about the Rusalki. Hissing emphasis was placed on the last word. Oh, okay, fine. The moon hung in the cloudy sky like a pale lantern. Come in, said a gruff voice. They opened the door to the small drawing and walked into a room lit to close, uh, lit by close to a hundred candles. Shadows danced crazily on the walls, a sight so distracting it took Locklear several moments before he noticed the strange old woman sitting cross-legged on the floor. No words were exchanged, but they walked across the room and sat on the floor in front of her. I shall speak of the Rusalki. As the woman spoke, she began to rock gently back and forth. Her gravelly voice taken on an honest line quality. Innocence lost, spring blossoms rubbed of carnal bliss, the goddess of death their first kiss, their first kiss. Candlelight flashed in the wetness of her eyes as she continued. They will shrink away from her touch, they hate her so, hate her so. Find the magic touch her, you too may feel her icy kiss. The woman's head dropped to her lap and Locklear got up to leave. He started to speak but thought better of it. They left the house as quickly as possible. So, yeah. That uh, presumably is how we are supposed to first learn of the Rusalki because you don't normally encounter them unless you're taking the long way around to Krondor. And speaking of which... Here's the road to Krondor, which should have one ambush right before it. Yep. We've made it to Krondor. But we're not going in there. We're going to set off the ambush. Well, I thought heading this way would set up the ambush, but I guess it only works if you're taking the north road, because this road... Well, that was sudden. Yeah, this was not the ambush I was anticipating, but you know what? Good chance to try out this spell, which I had not had a chance to try out yet. Yeah, Skyfire... Summons lightning. But it does a set amount of damage. But it's enough to one-shot 
most of the enemies with a good sword stroke. Well, one shot the enemies after a sword stroke. It does drain Owen's health rather quickly, though. Spoiled rations. Decent rations. And one in the middle. But yeah, rather than go through Krondor, we're going to finish exploring all the rest of the area that we're supposed to explore before we come to Krondor. They feel no pain, no sorrow, no greed. They have no anger, nor hatred, nor need. Yeah. And this is a rare two-word. This one is particularly easy if you've already gone to the Temple of Limbs Kragma and heard the priestess's words about how, you know, there is no joy in the realm of the dead, but neither is there sorrow. Which is a reference to a conversation in A Darkness at Sefanon where Pug and Tomas, the two great heroes of a story, have a chance to speak to the Deaf Goddess. And it's very much like Hades in Greek mythology, just all of the dead are standing around for eternity. And Pug does ask the deaf goddess, you know, is there no joy or happiness in this realm? And she says, no, but there is no sorrow either. And nothing in here but... more gear that we don't need. And don't particularly need to sell off at this point. Even with me having spent $200 on a book... And even though I don't think there's anything here except for that chest. Yep, just that one. <laughs> Round the corner and never group of uh, roguish mercenaries. We will be running into these guys a bit more now that uh, we're out of the northern part of the kingdom. But it does indicate that somebody is going through a lot of trouble to try and kill us. Yeah, these bandit ambushes aren't even a challenge at this point. Shows you what a bit of sneakiness and preparation can get you, right? In this case, it got some more healing potion. And I believe we're coming upon the village of Taniers. Yep, or Taniers. However you say that, well... This does seem like a good time to stop for this chapter, but next time we will go ahead and explore this village and continue our way northward into Egley, where uh, Isaac told us to look out for a poker player named Devon, which seems like a quest hook if ever there was one. We'll see you next time.